I used to get nervous when God would change the message. Because I used to feel fear behind not, uh, let me put it this way, and, until I became in tune with God and was able to hear what he was saying to me, and I prayed this prayer, and, and I would say at least once a month, once, once every other week, I, I prayed this prayer, Lord, bless me to recognize your voice. And not only to recognize your voice, but then to be able to obey your voice and work within your will. Yeah. Because there's a lot of times when things go on in our lives that we have our own mind as to how we want things to go yeah. and how we want things to be. And there are times when God is trying to whisper to us because God never yells at us. No. He, he never yells at us. He, he, he whispers to you. He speaks to you with a nice still voice. And, and it tries to get you to listen to what he's trying to say to you. Tries to stop you from listening to what you are saying to yourself. Because you got yourself into the situation by talking to yourself and listening to yourself. Oh, that's, that's a different piece of the message there. But you find out that when you begin to talk to yourself and listen to your words, you have a tendency to find yourself in precarious positions because it was not the will that God wanted to take place. Many times we find ourselves working within our will and not within God's will. So I was working through a message that I thought the Lord wanted me to give and then all of a sudden it changed again and, and I was working through that message and I'm sitting back and, and, and then came to Tuesday night and we, we had a, a service on Tuesday night here and, then, and there was a message that God gave to me on Tuesday night and I thought, okay, Lord, thank you. That's, that's the one you want me to give for Sunday. Well, then you find out that I woke up about three times, two or three times, I can't remember exactly, throughout the middle of the night today trying to figure out, Lord, what is the message you will have me to give to your people? And here's what he said to me. Let them know not to lose faith during their tests. That's okay. Well, where do I go with that one, Lord? What scripture do I use for that one? I've got these other scriptures that I, I think, what, what scripture do I use for that one, Lord? Don't let them lose faith during their test. And then he tagged another line onto it. He said, have them take pleasure in the grade they receive. And if my teachers are, are, are in the room, I think they'll be able to uh, extract a little bit of an understanding from this that I'm about to talk about because none of us mm -hmm. like taking exams. I, I don't know about you, when I was in school and I'm trying to go off of, you know, my recollection has been a few years and for some of you all it's been even longer than what my years of being in school have been, but I don't care how hard I studied, how much of the subject matter I knew, I never enjoyed taking the test. I may have known it like the back of my hand, but then when the teacher gave the test, that's a different story. And the reason why I didn't like taking the test, Mother Damn Wrong, was because I never really knew what the teacher was going to put on the exam. Because it was up to them to determine what questions they were going to ask on the exam. And if, uh, and, you know, and if you didn't know exactly what questions they were going to ask, it made you a little concerned as to, will I know the answer or not? And I had a lot of pride in the grades that I received, so I always wanted to do well on the exam. So I know none of us, but there might be a few that might enjoy taking tests. But I'm one of those that falls in the realm of not enjoying taking the test. 
No matter how much the instructor may have given to me, no matter how much they may have taught me, the book they may have shown me, the, the study periods that we may have had, the, the extra help that they may have given me, when it came time to taking the test, I was not always as comfortable. So the Lord took me to this passage here, and I think it will make sense to us. Let's go to the book of Luke. Going to speak to us from the Synoptic Gospels, and I know Matthew, Mark, and Luke have a rendition of this same story, but I like the way Luke put the story together. In the 22nd chapter of the book of Luke, and there are four verses, but I'm going to start with, it's actually the 31st verse through the 34th. I'm going to start with the most familiar verse to us, and that is the 34th verse of the 22nd chapter of Luke. And the Bible says to us in that 34th verse, and it says, and he said, and, there, and, and this is referencing Jesus. Those of you that may have a King James Version Bible that has Jesus written in red, in the 34th verse, and it says, and he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. In essence, in that 34th verse, he's saying Jesus is telling Peter, and this is after Jesus has, uh, you know, telling about his betrayal and, 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 and how he is going to have to undergo his crucifixion and, and his death and and he, he is speaking here, and he's letting them know that some things are about to happen. And you all are going to be tested, my disciples, my friends. You all are going to be tested. And Peter, I just want to let you know, because you, you've been so brave and, and you know, so vocal in all the work that you've been doing. I just want to let you know, Peter, when the testing time comes for you, yes, sir. You, you, you're going to deny me, man. I just want to let you know that up front. And Peter looked at Christ at that time almost with that type of indignation like, <laughs> not me. Yes. Ain't going to be me. But let me back us up just a minute. Let's go back up to the 31st verse because we all are familiar with the 34th. But here Jesus is speaking again. In the 31st verse of that same chapter, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan hath desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brother. And he said unto him, Lord, this is Peter now talking, Lord, I am ready. <laughs> I'm ready to go with thee. I'm ready to go with thee both into prison and to death. Yes, sir. You ever got so confident in yourself? You ever got so confident that you thought you knew everything that was going to be on the exam, that you didn't really think that you needed to study anymore because I got this? No need to worry about it because I know this subject. I know this particular topic that we're dealing with. I understand all of this. So there's nothing that I really have to worry Just give me the test, teacher. Just give me the exam. I'm going to ace this one. Only to find out that when they put the exam in front of you and you start reading a few of the questions, I'm going to say that's the way I felt when I took the SATs. Back before I went to college, there was an SAT exam that you take in order to get into college. And I felt that way because I went to all these study classes before the SAT. I, went, I had some study sessions. I had an independent person working with me to try and help me through my SAT. My upper bound program was walking me through what needed to take place with the SAT. I took some, set, some sample SAT exams. I had some tests that had already been done. I 
felt good about the SATs until I walked into the exam room and they sat me down with my number two pencil and they allowed me to open the exam book. And I think by the time I got, Sister Shirley, by the time I got to the third question, I was scratching my head. <laughs> scratching my head wondering, what in the world? And I'm looking around the class trying to see if I can get an answer off somebody. Because I'm looking at folks trying to see where they are on the exam. And I realized that nobody was there to help me. I was on my own. And you know the funny thing? That when I was taking the exam, the instructor never spoke a word. And I would look at the instructor, thinking that maybe through osmosis an answer would come to me. And there were times when I would raise my hand and I would walk up to the instructor and I would ask them a question about the question that was on the exam. And they would just look at me and they would say, Steve, I, I, I can't help you with that. I, I can't give you any of the answers. You, you can just try and remember what you studied. Try and remember what was taught to you previously. Try and recall some of the instructions that were given to you before. But other than that, I can't help you. Even the proctor of the exam was silent. You ever been in the midst of your struggle with Christ? And you begin to pray and you're asking questions and you're just not hearing anything back? Do you realize that Christ is like that instructor? That there are times when you're in the midst of your test that he's not speaking to you. Because he wants you to recall what he has already given to you. He wants you to recall what he has already said to you. He wants you to go and pull on the memory of what you have already been dealing with. Because if you think about what you're going through right now, this isn't the first time or, or the only time that you've ever had to deal with something like this. It might be different because of the situation, but the, the situation isn't different to God. Bible goes on, if we think back in the Synoptic Gospel, back in the book of Matthew, Jesus again was speaking and, and, and made a statement and said, but whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father, which is in heaven. Now it's interesting because you listen to that, what Jesus said, and then you read in the gospel where now God and Jesus is telling Peter, before the cock crows, Peter, you're going to deny me. And not only are you going to deny me, but you're going to deny me three times. So it's not bad enough that you denied me once. It's not bad enough that you deny me twice. But you are going to deny me three times. And God said, think about this. You're going to deny me and because I know you're going to deny me, I did something before that. Jesus was speaking to Peter and told him what he was going to do. But before he told him what he was going to do, he let him know who the person was that was after him. In the 31st verse, he tells them, Peter, Satan desires to have you. Do you all know that Satan desires to have each and every one of you that's sitting in the room right now? Amen. Satan desires to have you also. But here's the thing. After Jesus said that to Peter, I'm sure it may have made Peter's eyebrow rise a little bit, may have made him have a little buckeye, just a little bit, like what? But then Jesus said something comforting to him. After he said, Satan desires.
is to have you. He wants to sift you like wheat. After that, after that particular statement, Jesus says, but I have prayed for you. Do you know that Jesus, once he's prayed for you, that now he has comforted you, that now he has protected you? It's almost like Job, when, when Satan went to heaven and wanted to capture or wanted to do something to Job, he spoke to God and told God, there's nothing I can do because you got him hedged in. But I guarantee you, Lord, if you lower the hedge, I'll make him curse you to your face. And God made it very clear to say, I'll lower the hedge. You just can't take his, his life. I'm looking at this same situation with Peter. Peter is being told by Jesus, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan has desired to have you that he might sift you as wheat. Do you all understand that there's a process between sifting wheat? There, there are two steps in it. Let me, let me help you understand. Maybe this will make sense to you as to what was going on with Peter. The first step is a manual thrashing. We, we understand it's pulled up and then it all gets laid together. And this manual thrashing, the manual thrashing of wheat, it is so that it will loosen the chafe that is around the wheat. Now, how do you go about loosening the chafe that is around the wheat? The manual thrashing of the wheat is done by taking the wheat itself and laying it out on a concrete or hard surface or on a rock and you begin to beat it so that it loosens the chafe that is around the wheat, that's around the grain itself. You begin to beat it. Do you realize that when, that, that when Jesus made this statement that Satan desires to sift you like wheat, meaning that he is going to beat you the way that they beat wheat. You're going to be laid out on a hard surface, or you're going to be laid out on a rock, and he's going to begin to beat you, but I'm allowing it to happen because I want the chafe that is keeping the grain from having access, I want the chafe that is around you to be loosened so that when it is off of you, you'll be able to flourish as the grain of wheat does. It gets beat. But then that's not only the process. Once the chafe has been loosened, because you realize there are sometimes chafe likes to hold on to the grain of wheat. And, and, and those of you that may be farmers or may understand, understand that old-fashioned technique of loosening up the wheat itself, you would beat the chafe. But then there is another process that is called winnowing or winnow. When you winnow something or when you're winnowing something, that means that you are now taking that particular process or, or you're loosening the, the grain itself, loosening up the grain, and you're allowing it to remove itself from the less important things that may be around it. The shape, the grain of wheat is what is important to the human body. The chafe is no good to you. So now when the winnowing takes place, after it has been beaten, and then the farmer then takes the beaten wheat, and they take the wheat and they throw it into the air. And when they toss it into the air, the lightest breeze will come along and blow away any of the chafe that is trying to hold on to the grain of wheat. So now Jesus is telling Peter, listen, Satan wants you. And I don't want you to be concerned about it because what he's going to do, Satan is going to beat you. And then when he beats you, he is going to try and, uh, after he beats you, he is then going to take you and throw you into the air. And as he throws you into the air, it, it, it's going to be a process that you're going to go through. I don't want you to be concerned about it. I know it may be painful. I know that it may, be, it may hurt you, but I want you to recognize that the loosening of that shape, the loosening of that discouragement, the loosening of that mindset, the loosening of what your friends need to do, the loosening of how people are talking about you, the loosening of how people are looking at you, once that falls off of you, then that that will be left will be of my use and it will be edible for my enjoyment. But the process of getting wheat is a painful process that you have to go through. 
You understand that when you're whittling something down, that you're removing it or, or you're losing it. I'm, I, and the Lord took me to Gideon's army. Gideon had thousands of men, hundreds of thousands of men with him. But God whittled down Gideon's army. And when he whittled it down, that that was left was going to be for God's usage, not for Gideon's usage. You look at when Peter was going through this particular situation. You realize that when Peter was going through this, it was described to him while he was with the other 12. But when Peter denied Christ all three times, he was by himself. Meaning that he had to be removed from his friends. He had to be removed from some of the people that were around him. He had to be removed from some of the people that may have been talking with him because those individuals couldn't help him through this particular situation. Do you realize that sometimes you have to be removed from your friends? You realize that sometimes you have to be removed from the things that you might, your comfort zone or what you might be dealing with. Do you realize that sometimes God wants you to get away from some of the people that might be influencing you so that he can give you the influence that you need? And when that happens to us, we often have a tendency to feel as though we're all alone. And when we feel as though we're all alone, we feel as though God isn't with us. And when we feel as though God isn't with us, and we feel as though we can't make it through this situation. And we feel as though we can't make it through the situation that we find ourselves acting as if we're going to fail and that there's nothing that can help us through this crisis. And then we begin to think carnally instead of spiritually. And a carnal mind is enmity unto God. And God is looking for us to stop thinking with our carnal mind and start believing him with our spiritual mind. Do you realize that your spiritual mind can see much further than what your carnal mind can even imagine? Your spiritual mind can see things that your carnal mind will have you not believing. Your spiritual mind will, will say things to you that will have your carnal mind making you fight against what your spiritual mind is trying to tell you. That's why I pray to God and say, God, help me to hear your voice because that spiritual mind is God speaking to you. Your carnal mind is you speaking to you. So I pray to God, Lord, help me to hear and recognize your voice. And not only, not only do I want to recognize it, but I want to be able to obey it. And then once I obey it, Lord, help me to walk in your will. Because if I stay in my will, it will be carnal. And I understand that that will be enmity unto you. Do you realize that Jesus has already prayed for you? Yes. Yeah. Oh. Yes, yeah. Oh, yeah. Mm. Do you realize that Jesus has already prayed for you? Yes, yeah. Come on. Listen to it. Listen to it. Let me, let me put it to us this way. There are times when we find ourselves in the midst of situations. And we think that because God is not speaking back to us, because God is not saying something to us, that he is not hearing us and he's not answering us. But what you must understand is that you are in the midst of your test and that the instructor, the proctor, is not speaking to you during the test because he wants you to go on your recall. He wants you to go back and look at what he has already done for you and stop asking him for a different outcome. God is trying to tell you that I am giving the exam to you. I have already prayed for you and I'm putting you through the test because Satan can't do anything to you as a child of God without my permission. And since I've given him permission, then realize that I am in the midst of the test with you. Here, maybe I can help us even a little better with this one. Don't worry about it just as Peter failed the exam, not once, not twice, but three times. Don't worry about it because God has already appointed it that even though you might fail this test, I am not giving up on you because you failed the test once. I'm not giving up on you because you failed the test twice. If you remember, before God, before Jesus told Peter that he was going to deny him three times, he said to him, after you have converted 
strengthen yourself, go and strengthen your brothers. So now Christ knew, Peter, you're going to mess up. I know it. Not only are you going to mess up once, you're going to mess up twice. Matter of fact, you're going to mess up three times. But after you then find yourself, after you then realize that I need you, Lord, back in my life, I do need you, Lord. I can't do anything without you. Once you realize that and you have now found yourself back in the will of God again, then go and strengthen your brothers. How did he do that? Do you realize that after this, Peter, when you read this Matthew, Mark, and Luke story, then you go over into the book of Acts, and I think we all know the story about what Peter did afterwards. He preached a message that didn't save just one person. He preached a message that didn't save a hundred people. Peter preached a message that not only delivered men and women, there were thousands that were saved after Peter denied Christ. Jesus told him, I pray for thee that that faith faileth not. God is saying, don't lose faith during your tests. Don't lose faith in the midst of your tests. Realizing that every time you make a mistake, God is not, Christ is not coming back down here and going back on the cross again to die for you all over again. Because of how many times we mess up, that would be just an insurmountable job for Christ to do. But the Bible tells me that Christ is now seated on the right hand of his Father. Now understand this, and I will take us back just a, a little bit of history here. When the priests used to go in behind the veil in order to do the atonement for our sins, there was no mercy seat inside of the tomb where they would go in. There was no altar for them to sit down on. It was for them when they went in, they had to stand in order to ask for the forgiveness of our sins. But now that Christ has come and he has died for all of our sins and the ultimate sacrifice has been given, the Bible tells me that Christ now is seated on the right hand of his father. He's seated there because the, the job is finished. When he was hanging on the cross, he yelled up to his father. He said to his father, Father, it is finished. So now that we may make a mistake, now that we may have a situation where we feel as if we have sinned against you, Lord, we have sinned against you, Christ, it is not for Christ to come back again because he is already seated on the right-hand side of his Father and told us that if we should ever have a problem with sin, that we have an advocate, that we can come to Christ because Christ has prayed for us. And even in the midst of Satan trying to sift us as weak, you must understand that Christ has prayed for you. He's already prayed for you to come through the problem that you're in. He's already prayed for you to come through the battle that you're dealing with. He's already prayed for you to come over the situation that you're dealing with. How many of you know that Christ has prayed for you already? That he's given you an okay, a stamp of approval that even though you may have made a mistake on the exam, you have an opportunity to correct the mistake and get a passing grade on the test that you're taking. I know that I'm in the midst of the battle. I know that I'm in the midst of the storm, Lord, but I am not going to lose faith in the midst of my test because, God, you said that you prayed for me, that you're there with me in the midst of the trial, that you're there with me in the midst of my struggle. Lord, help me to receive a passing grade on this exam. If I have to take it a second time, Lord, help me to pass the test a second time. If I have to take it a third time, Lord, help me to pass the test and receive a passing grade on the exam. Have you ever wondered sometimes when you don't hear from God what he's saying to you? Here's what I want you to understand. It's not that he's not speaking to you. It's not that he doesn't hear you. It's just that he's trying to let you know, recall. How many of you all can remember when God delivered you from something? 
just by a show of hands. How many of you all can remember when God has delivered you from something? When he delivers you from it, what he wants you to do, when he's not speaking to you, he's asking you recall. Think about what I did for you five years ago, ten years ago, five five weeks ago. Think about what I did. Just recall. And think about what I did for you and then use that as your barometer for calling out to me. It's not that I'm not going to answer you, but it's just that you're in the midst of a test right now and as an instructor, I can't speak to you in the midst of the test. But after the test is over with, you ever seen these teachers when they come back and you've done well on the exam? They walk with a smile on their face and they place the paper down in front of you. And then there's sometimes when you didn't do so well on the exam, they take the exam, they put it down, and they flip it over. Because they don't want anybody else to see how bad your grade was. So out of your privacy, they take the exam and they place it over, and they sometimes write a note on the exam. Come see me after class. How many of you all know that? Sometimes when you go into your secret closet, you're going to see God after class. You're in the midst of your test. You're in the midst of your struggle. You're in the midst of your battle, and you realize that I, I'm failing it or I failed it. And God slips you a little note and says, come see me <laughs> after class. And, or he, he slips you a note and says, I have office hours Monday through Saturday. Call me anytime. I'm available on your schedule. You let me know when you need me, and I will be there to help you. How many of you know that you can call on God anytime yeah. after the exam, and he will then come in and help you through the process? He will talk to you very clearly, very vividly, and let you know this is where you went wrong. You had your instructors, and they have told you when you didn't solve the problem correctly. They walked you through step by step everything you needed to do to answer that question properly and what you needed to do the next time you have a question like this. And then when you get to that point, that question comes up and all of a sudden you remember what the instructor said to you. And you begin to feel good when you begin to answer the question. And then as you're answering the question, you're feeling very confident because it seems much easier now that you have listened to what the instructor said to you. You don't need the instructor to talk to you during the middle of the exam, just don't lose faith that what they taught you before the exam is still there with you. Because now your recall is coming back for you. It's coming back into you. And you're able to do things all right. You're able to go through your situation all right. You're able to go through your crisis without a problem because your recall is coming back. And you realize that God is going to be there with you. You realize that God is going to be in the midst of the battle with you. I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That's what the Bible tells me, and that's what I have to believe when I'm in the midst of my trial. I'll never leave you, and I'll keep the imperfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. Stop thinking about your problem. Stop thinking about your situation and continue to think about God because in the midst of your situation, he said, I'll keep you in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on me. And I'm remembering just as Peter had stated, and just as Jesus had stated to Peter, he says, even though the devil is out to sift you as we Peter, remember this. I have prayed for you. And in the midst of my praying for you, I have shielded you from some of the battles that you may have to go through. I have shielded you from some of the injuries that you may have to suffer. I know you may go through this trial. I know you may go through this struggle. But I'm telling you, after you've gone through it and you've strengthened yourself and you realize that, Lord, I made some mistakes, but I want you to be here with me. Lord, I made some errors, but I want you to stay here with me. Lord, I've made some issues. Lord, but I want you to be with me. Now that I've gone through this situation and I've converted myself and now just as the prodigal son had to come to himself, it's not where God is going to make you get saved. He's not going to make you change your mind, but he looks at you and says, you make up your mind. When I was growing up, you all told me that to get saved with a well made up mind. And once I make up my mind, then I'm going to live for you, Lord. Once I make up my mind, then I'm going to give it all to you, Lord. Once I make up my mind that you are worth living for, Lord. 
once I make up in my mind that everything that I'm going through, that I know that you're there with me, Lord. I'm realizing that everything is going to be all right, even though I'm going through this trial, even though I'm going through this situation, even though I'm going through this struggle, everything is going to be all right. There was a song that I used to sing, and I know we started out with praise him, but now I know there is a song that says, I got a feeling everything is going to be all right. I know you may have been dealing with some situations. I know you may have been dealing with some crisis. I know you may have been dealing with some issues, but I've got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. They would sing that over and over, and then they would come back and they would say, the Holy Ghost told me that everything is going to be all right. I know you may be going through, but the Holy Ghost is, is trying to tell you that everything is going to be all right. There's no need for you to give up. There's no need for you to quit. There's no need for you to lose your faith. Realize, don't let your faith fail in the midst of your test because everything, everything is going to be all right. Even though you're going through this struggle, everything is going to be all right. Even though you're in the midst of the battle, everything is going to be all right. I've got a feeling that everything is going to be all right. I don't know what you're dealing with. I don't know what you're going through. But everything is going to be all right. Sister Jeanette, I think that rings well with you. That everything is going to be all right. Sister Marva, I think that rings well with you. That everything is going to be all right. Whatever you're going through, whatever you're dealing with, don't lose faith during your test. Because everything, everything going to be all right. You may be looking through carnal eyes and God is saying, see with the spiritual eye. Because what your carnal mind is trying to tell you, I'm letting you know that everything is going to be all right. Even though your carnal eyes tell you I can't see through it, your spiritual eye is saying I can see beyond it. Even though your carnal mind is saying I can't believe your spiritual mind is saying I serve a God that is able even though your carnal mouth is saying it can't be done God is saying whose report will you believe I believe the report of God I believe the report of my father everything everything is going to be alright I've got a feeling everything's going to be alright
that message was for me. All right. And I don't believe that God only delivered that message just for me. Maybe there's somebody else that realizes that everything is going to be all right now. But what I needed to do is once I received this message, I went back to the 32nd verse that said, but I have prayed for you. When Jesus told Peter, even though Satan desires to have you and sift you as wheat, he fixed him up, he encouraged him and said, but I have prayed for you. And I realized that once God, Jesus realized that once I put prayer out for you, there's nothing that Satan can do to me. So I ask you, maybe you're dealing, maybe you're going through something in your life. Jesus is saying the message was delivered for you as well. And to let you know that I have prayed for you. So I ask you, if you're dealing with something in your life, no matter how minor, no matter how minute, no matter how major it might be, can you bring that situation to the altar? 